University of Washington Genome Sciences Education Outreach. And we've created a lot of uh, educational uh, materials around type 2 diabetes. And today's activity is really a um, something that we ran with during kind of the pandemic, where we took uh, one of our kind of hit activities and turned it into a video game. And so I'm going to just kind of show you what that, that main activity looks like, but it's really our, it's our type 2 diabetes model board. And also, I apologize that I am quite ill today, which is one of the nice things about doing this online, is nobody's at risk of catching anything uh, from me. So this is our uh, type 2 diabetes model board, and so many folks might be aware of this already, but the idea here is you print out a big sheet that then uh, students will follow along with different scenarios to then model the activity of type 2 diabetes inside of the body. And so glucose is represented by different pasta pieces, as is insulin, glucagon, and glycogen. And so an example that would happen here is you eat pancakes, there's a lot of glucose coming in, which then tips this meter up to then have the body release insulin into the bloodstream, which then allows for that glucose to go into the body. It's all sorts of extra scenarios that make that more challenging. And we've taken these scenarios and built them into a game where instead of following along through the rules of how to move the glucose pieces or the different pasta pieces, your real time uh, releasing insulin into the bloodstream, choosing what kind of food you want to eat, and kind of dealing with the consequences inside the body with regards to what's happening. And also we out, and in that main workbook, we have links to our main uh, curriculum site. And so here you have links that go to all the blood sugar balance. Uh, we're doing culinary macromolecules coming up in a few weeks, uh, as well as our foundational unit links. If you're a health teacher, fax teacher, or a biology teacher, and then we have these kind of extension activities that could be used in a lot of different contexts. So um, if you were to follow along through the website or say, if you go to the workbook, click on blood sugar balance, you can go to the lesson website. The lesson website looks like this. Um, and on this website is everything you need to teach this lesson, whether you're doing it online or in class, it's kind of the same. Uh, we have links there to watch a video on how to play the game. We're going to watch that in just a second. Um, we have a link to actually go play the game, a place for you to submit scores. This is a link that goes to a graph showing everybody's data that has ever played this game. You can look at the averages uh, and all the different compare the different settings. And then this, this link here for teacher resources is everything that you need to teach this in your classroom. We have a lot of background information on kind of what was the thought process behind making the different elements of the game. Uh, and unless we have any questions, I'm just going to go ahead and have you watch the intro video that I already have queued up on YouTube. But are there any questions out there? And if at any point you're kind of lost or a link's not working, uh, Joan is going to be monitoring the chat to make sure that we can do any troubleshooting on the fly. And so let's see if this works because here I'm going to reshare. Okay, this should work. And here we go. Watch your sound just in case uh, the sound settings are too high. Blood Sugar Balance is a serious game to explore metabolism and better understand the impact and physiology of type 2 diabetes. During the game, you score points by keeping your blood sugar levels in a healthy range. You can track your levels in the center of the screen. Each round takes less than two minutes to play. During the day, you can choose when and what foods you eat. When you eat a food, blood sugar levels will rise. You'll notice that foods with refined sugars will lead to faster increases in blood sugar, while whole foods release more slowly. The organs of the body need sugar to function. In Blood Sugar Balance, you will play the role of the pancreas by releasing important hormones into the bloodstream to help control blood sugar levels. Insulin secreted into the bloodstream will help get sugar in to the organs of the body. 
you will notice that the brain uses a lot of sugar but does not need insulin. Here you can see when insulin is working at the insulin receptors on the organ tissue. Here you can see when insulin is running low and then when insulin is absent from the organ. When blood sugar is low and you don't want to eat, you can trigger the pancreas to release glucagon. Glucagon tells the liver to release stored sugar into the blood. In addition to pancreatic hormones, you can exercise to quickly diminish blood sugar levels. At the end of the game, you'll get your final score and a graph readout of your blood sugar levels throughout the day. Play again with different settings and make different choices to compare your scores. When starting the game, you will choose your diabetic status. When you are not diabetic, the pancreas is functioning at full capacity and can produce the full amount of insulin. When selecting pre-diabetic, the pancreas produces less insulin and insulin is less effective at getting sugar in to the organs. When type 2 diabetes is selected, insulin production is significantly limited. You will likely need to use medical insulin. Injecting medical insulin will supplement the insulin from the pancreas. Find it in the bottom right corner of the screen. The second game setting focuses on access level. Low access limits your options for food, exercise, and healthcare. Low access simulates living in a food desert or in situations where gym memberships and healthcare is unaffordable. With high access, money is not a problem. You can afford all kinds of foods and a gym membership. Additionally, you have time for recreational exercise and can afford any healthcare cost. Settings for middle access falls between the two extremes. Blood sugar balance is a serious game. It is designed to balance being fun, challenging, and entertaining with being educational. Ultimately, it's important to remember that it is a simulation of a serious bodily function and does not perfectly model metabolism in type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is a serious condition impacting the lives of many people. We hope that blood sugar balance can help you better understand the impacts of diabetes on the body and factors that impact the treatment and management of the disease. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna run through and I'm gonna play a round of the game kind of live on screen. So you can see essentially how fast uh, it's played. And then I'm gonna send you off to do a few rounds of playing the game. Then we're gonna report back our scores for each of the different game settings that you play on. And then we'll compare the scores to see kind of what those average scores are for each of the different game settings. I'm gonna get started here with click play the game. And I'm gonna share my screen again, uh, but I'm not gonna share the sound because uh, you need to hear what I'm... Uh, Good. It's funny because I can hear the music, so I'm uh, <laughs> a little distracted, but that's quite all right. So uh, here we go to start. This tells you a little bit about the game, but you've already heard about that, so you can click next. Um, here, if you're playing on a cell phone, unfortunately, as soon as you select something, it double clicks and you can't really choose your settings. It's a glitch on the iPhone or on a cell phone, but if you're playing on your computer screen, this works fine. So you select your status and we're gonna start, you know, we're gonna go ahead and start with type two diabetes. And then we choose our access levels. So I'm gonna go for middle access. And then this kind of walks us through the general gameplay. So keep your blood sugar balance or blood sugar level in range between 70 and 180. You'll see that here with a meter that will turn red if it's too high, blue if it's too low, green is an optimal section. Uh, down here, food options will pop up. You can select those to then eat it and release blood sugar into the bloodstream. And then you wanna keep an eye on the body tissues to make sure that there's insulin present to nourish those body, uh, the different body organs. Um, and then down here is kind of the biggest piece is releasing insulin and glucagon. Since you're playing with type 2 diabetes, this insulin button won't refresh as fast, but we will have medical insulin available from time to time down in the bottom here. And then we also have exercise options popping up down here to the left.
And then here we go. And so this will keep track of what time of day it is here. So right off the bat, I'm going to eat a big breakfast of pancakes, knowing I need to release as much insulin as possible. Probably need to go to medical insulin there. So we can see that we're now getting blood sugar into the body and we're maintaining this healthy balance. And so my blood sugar is getting a little low again. I'm going to eat rice and beans for lunch. Make sure to release some insulin. And I'm going to eat a snack. I'm going to go for ice cream. But with that snack, I'm going to go to the gym after eating that snack to try to help mitigate some of that insulin. So again, we're getting our glucose levels too high. That ice cream was a lot. So we got to release insulin to get that blood sugar down. And maybe go to the gym again since it's continually too high. And so now we're going into dinner time and I'm going to eat some spaghetti knowing that I better be ready for that big uh, burst of glucose coming in. And maybe go for another walk. Oh, my blood sugar is really high. So you'll see there's definitely a difference in the refresh rate of insulin. But fortunately, I can go walk whenever I want. All right, we're finally getting our blood glucose levels down. OK, so now when we, oh, I must have gotten, stayed too high for too long. And unfortunately, my I didn't get a score here. But you can see my blood glucose levels over time, really spaghetti in a gym session didn't really help at this point. And so we can kind of track this. One of the things is if you are playing on your cell phone, you can look at this sentence here, which will tell you that you played with type 2 diabetes at middle access. Um, and then we can go here, try again, which will go back to the same settings. Or we can just go back to the, the main home page. And we can start over again with choosing our settings. OK. So the thing that I'm going to ask you to do, though, is as you're playing and you're going through the different settings, uh, make sure that you're writing down what your settings are and what your score is. Um, on our site, on our site, you'll have the option to submit your scores. And I can show you what that looks like. So here, if you click Submit Your Scores, It'll bring up this form, which we'll share the form in the chat so that you can fill it out. So link to submit your scores. Uh, for this, you click which setting you, you had it on and then your score and it'll submit. I'll get that data in a, in a, and we'll look over it um, together. Um, let's see, what else should we discuss before we get started? I think we're ready to go. Again, we'll be mon monitoring the chat. Feel free to unmute and ask any questions as you're going. And um, good luck. Let's play three rounds on three different settings. And we'll go from there and come back together in, let's give ourselves 15 minutes. And we can give ourselves more time if we need. OK, is everybody done playing the game? If so. Give me a wave or a thumbs up in the reactions. Cool. OK, so there's a few questions that came up in the chat. And so the first one was uh, type 1 diabetes. Why is that not addressed in this game? Uh, we were kind of limited with regards to what scenarios we were tackling. Um, during development and really our full curriculum was really built on type two diabetes rather than focusing on type one diabetes. Um, however, the type two diabetes um, setting is fairly similar to what type one diabetes would be like, except there would probably be less insulin available from the body uh, to be released. Um, so there's a little bit difference there. And Whereas uh, type 2 diabetes can be brought on by kind of um, 
uh, food choices and genetic factors that put you at risk. Type 1 diabetes is purely genetic. And so it's something that comes on where the body's just not able to produce insulin um, from a genetic uh, issue. Um, but this could be used to model type 1 diabetes as well. Um, but we kind of focused on what we had curriculum materials for. Um, let's see, what's the other questions that we had? Um, yeah, so did, did anybody notice a big difference between the access options? What kind of things did we see at different levels of access? Like the low one, the only thing you could do is walk. <laughs> For the high access, there's more options, more times to help lower it down. Did folks find the exercise to be a really effective additional element besides just choosing certain foods? Yeah. Um, did anybody notice kind of a pattern though with um, kind of their scores and kind of the dips and valleys of uh, over the course of uh, the gameplay? It's sort of built up midday, I would say. And, you know, then I wouldn't eat. I would eat like two meals and then not eat dinner to get it back down. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that, that we talk about is that we can look at the kind of the graph there and then we can assess like how realistic is that in real life? Um, one of the issues that we had was really optimizing kind of the gameplay to make sure that we were getting a reasonable amount of food eaten throughout the day. And so this isn't going to be a, a direct one-to-one -one, um, comparison to real life, but we can see you know, the effectiveness of exercising after a big meal or making sure that you're kind of preloading insulin as you're eating to make sure that you can handle that, that sugar rush essentially that's coming. Um, and yeah, so one of the things is that this game, <laughs> yeah, I've seen some good uh, comments about the different food types, right? So spaghetti, when we have those kind of simplified carbohydrates turning into sugar inside the bloodstream very quickly, we're going to get those massive spikes in our, our blood glucose. Um, did anybody notice anything about the different kinds of food that you ate and the, the speed with which glucose was being released into the bloodstream? Well, it's the simple versus the complex sugars, right? Yeah. And one of the things that we've seen people do is that if, you know, your blood glucose is getting really low, really fast, you can drink something like a Gatorade mm -hmm. or a soda pop to get your blood sugar up. And you'll be able to assess very quickly, like how much you need to kind of mod moderate that blood sugar spike. Whereas if you eat, say, pancakes or... Um, you know, beans and rice, those can be very large doses of blood sugar coming in, but it gets released a little bit more slowly. So if you were to use that to mitigate kind of low blood sugar, it might take a little bit longer for that to kick in. Um, and I saw another comment here about um, kind of how scary, so playing with low access, it's super hard to regulate the blood sugar. Um, what do we think about kind of how scary or how challenging that can be uh, with kind of the low, low access or um, mitigating type two diabetes in, in the gameplay? It ends up being deadly, you know, so it would be a good kind of um, talking point about social difficulties within our healthcare system and poverty and access and all that. Right, right. And one of the big things that we, we hope from the curriculum is that we don't disempower the students in, in playing the game where it's like, well, I have low access, so I just know that there's no way that I can regulate my blood glucose. But if you actually look at some of the data, you can still get pretty high scores with low access. But the difference is that you need to be more diligent and more focused on what foods you're choosing from, say, the bodega or what kind of how much you're walking throughout the day or just making sure that you're not accidentally gravitating too much towards the sugariest foods that are, that are made available. Um, and so I'm gonna walk you all through um, some of the teacher resources that we have around this. Um, so 
I'm going to share my screen for just a second here. And so if we go back to the main teacher page and we go to teacher resources, um, we've got uh, the ability for you to, to make copies of all of these for your own records, but you have say teacher background information. So if you want to read up more on how we built the game, why we built different features in, uh, we also have a bunch of questions that we kind of already uh, hit on in our discussion. And of course, it takes forever to load. But that's uh, one of the things you can do is you can take screen captures of these readouts and you can say, like, how reasonable is it to walk three times a day and only eat three, three meals uh, down here on the corner? That's, you know, can be challenging. Um, oh, yeah, we have a lot of these reflection questions. So, like, what surprised you while playing the game? On your best round, what did you do to control blood sugar levels? Uh, what happened on your worst round or when blood sugar kind of got out of control? Uh, reflections on diabetic status, um, access levels. So we have kind of questions built in, as well as discussion about fiber within the different food types. So each of the foods that are available has a net amount of glucose that gets released as well as a score for how fast it gets released into the bloodstream. So that's a proxy for a glycemic index of different kinds of foods. So you can compare soda pop versus a hearty breakfast. Um, we also have the insulin mechanism here. Um, and then we have a hidden feature that's not really prominent, but could be used as kind of a way to talk about uh, the conversion of excess glucose into fat stores in the adipose of the body. So uh, up in the, the top right, when the uh, glucose levels inside the liver are very high, it starts converting some of that glucose into fat tissue. And then that adipose storage of glucose um, kind of goes up and up and up um, while the, the adipose is also using some glucose. Um, this is something that is kind of um, tackled in more detail in the model board scenario. And so some of the teachers that we've worked with will use the hands-on model board where students are following through with the activity hands-on wise before then transitioning into this where then they are you know are given free reign to make choices for themselves and this is one of those things that doesn't have to be you know tackled in the classroom but it can be something that you just kind of keep an eye on while you're playing if say you're having students play in pairs um uh, and then i i think uh, Dana, you hit on the idea of addressing equity. So what kind of factors could contribute to access levels? And then how do we mitigate that, that problem? Which I think ties into the larger curriculum is that's really the, the goal of our of all of our lessons is to help students recognize and understand the different factors at play uh, when it comes to type 2 diabetes. Um, any questions about the teacher kind of guidebook here? All right, so then the, the last piece that I'm gonna talk about is what I really see as kind of my favorite part of this is that while you're playing, you're collecting scores. And so you could just collect scores for the different settings inside your classroom and then have students go to the board and graph those. We have a classroom data table that we've put together so that students can um, document and keep track of their own scores so they could add little sticky notes to this graph, or in the case of, where is this? I think this is a doc that we have available for, oh, it's the wrong, the wrong link. Um, oh, here it is, student data table and reflection questions. So this is like a worksheet that you could use to accompany this, but they could play at each of these rounds to get uh, to get scores and report them back out. Um, but we did build into the game a, a way that you can compare your classroom scores to all the scores that anybody has submitted ever. And so when you submit your scores to that Google form, it then, um, will read out as a graph on this page. 
And so this is real-time data. So this has all of your scores included into it, which is why it always takes a little while to load. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it takes some time. But so here we have our average scores for low access, middle access, high access, with no diabetes in blue, uh, red is pre-diabetes, and then yellow is diabetes. And what we can see is that the average score goes up with more access uh, without diabetes, as well as a little bit here with diabetes. Um, and then you might see this kind of strange pattern with pre-diabetes. One of the reasons why we think that we have that issue happening is because our N for uh, pre-diabetes is pretty low for most of these situations, as well as the middle access. So we have the most data for these. Um, but you can kind of take your classroom data, compare it to the data here. Um, and what I did today was I actually took all the data that of the scores that you all submitted, and we can then look at the averages here. And uh, we, we don't really have enough data to make any kind of major um, comparisons or predictions, but we can kind of see here, at least at the low access level where we have the most data, we have a decrease in the average scores with type two diabetes. Uh, and y'all did a really great job with diabetes and high access. You got very high scores, even higher than without diabetes, which um, I think is indicative of, you know, the uh, variability that we have from individual to individual. We don't know exactly why you know, the scores would be higher here, even though we kind of would expect them to be pretty, um, a lot lower. But if we compare that then back to the data that we're looking at on the main page, uh, we can kind of compare how it happened in the classroom and discuss why we might have these differences. Okay. Are there any questions about the activities or anything that we have uh, as far as the materials are here? Do we see any potential issues or problems kind of using this in the classroom other than that the game is kind of hard? That's what I was gonna ask. How long does it, do you let them have a few rounds just to figure it out? How much do you, you preload the information so that they can be successful or do you just let them figure it out? Yeah, so this is one of the things that I'm, unfortunately we don't have enough pilot testing to know exactly how teachers are using this in the classroom. Uh, one of the biggest uh, pieces that we've we've found is that that the students really like playing the game, um, even if they're kind of getting zeros or their you know blood sugar levels are going too high or too low in the rounds. Uh, one thing that I think um, because we have a lot of settings available in this game, I think it's actually almost more useful to break it down into the kind of the binary extremes. Uh, so play with uh, di diabetes and without diabetes, with low access and high access, because those are kind of the ones that are going to push the biggest comparisons within the group. Um, if you had a lot more time for gameplay, you could have them play all the different settings, but you know that's nine different settings, nine different rounds of five minutes a piece, or two to four minutes a piece. You know, time goes by pretty quick. Um, so if you had them play four rounds at different levels, that could be really helpful in that, in that sense. Um, but it also helps to just give the students some time to play the game to figure out exactly how to, to work it before they start collecting data, like one or two rounds before they collect is, can be really useful. Um, but that's one of the big things that we're trying to figure out is this game is the final version that we have here is relatively new. And so we're still figuring out how well it works in the classroom. Um, but the feedback that we have gotten is that this pairs it really well with the model board activity um, from the main biology curriculum. But that's a good question. So might it be suggested that you do the, the model game before you do this? Okay. That's that's what the, te the teachers are saying that once they understand the kind of the, um, the different parts of the game, right? So knowing what insulin is, what glu glucagon is, what, you know, how the body processes that blood sugar, it helps them jump into the game and understand the parts. The nice thing is a lot of students are pretty familiar with games. So 
I think they actually take to it a lot faster than, um, than, than a lot of teachers that we've worked with. Um, but it's, uh, as you can see, it's, it's a fast game play. Um, and I think it's really important to frame it as that this is a simulation model. It's not a hundred percent accurate and it can bring out themes, but it's not, um, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, even though we do, we did our best to get the, the data optimized. Uh, there's still a lot of minor kind of glitches in there. Okay, that great. Um, so for anybody that um, is Washington State teachers, uh, we're going to have you, um, let's see, I'm going to share my screen again just so that you, can, you can see where you can go to sign up for clock hours. Um, if you go to this main workbook, go to the over, overview tab, uh, you can sign in on this sheet uh, to get your clock hours and just add your name and we'll, uh, at the end of March, we'll get you uh, the form with the number of clock hours that you've put in. Oh, and also we have, um, we forgot to do this last round or last session, but uh, the workshop evaluation link here, if you can fill out the workshop evaluation, that helps um, as well. And um, we need the evaluation specifically if you're looking for clock hours. Yeah. And all right. Well, thank you all for joining us on this. And uh, I can stay on for another 10 minutes if anybody wants to talk more about any of the curriculum materials. If not, we're kind of done with this module. Uh, I clearly have gotten really good at presenting this very quickly because I think I did it once in 30 minutes at a, at a yeah. and so I kind of went through things pretty fast, but really appreciate your time. And um, we are here for support if you want to try using this in your classroom. Uh, and we love feedback on this as well. I love this. I think this is the best version yet of all the ones you guys have done. So. It, it's for, for, for me and Jonah, for me, at least it was a kind of a dream come true. I'm so happy that it worked out. It's, it, it's, you know, there's little pieces where I'm like, oh, if I could have my dream uh, optimization of all the different pieces, like, you know, it would, it would take it to the next level. But I think we got really close to, um, to the model board and, and, and what we're looking for. Thanks. Yeah, I think if I were to to want anything for it, it would be a way to make the low access one have maybe some simple accessible food choices or something that kids could see, oh, maybe if I don't eat, you know, the candy bar and instead I have this, I don't know, Slim Jim or something that you can get at the bodega that it at least won't be quite as bad for my blood sugar or something like that. Yeah, I, think I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Have you guys given any consideration to dropping BMI stuff from your materials, especially from the first part? <laughs> Since it's such like a, you know, hot topic, bad, you know, I just, I avoid that. I don't show that slide when I'm doing this with my kids because I think it, I just don't want anyone to feel stigmatized in class. So I honestly try to avoid talking about body size at all when it comes to any of this and only just about, you know, food choices and exercise choices and, you know, things like that. So I'm just wondering where you guys are on that. Yeah, I think, I think Joe might have a good answer for where we're going well, with that. Just to say, I, I hear you and, um, it's actually more prevalent in the health curriculum as opposed to the biology curriculum. And we've gone back and forth because a lot of teachers in health um, say that like they, they, that's part of what they are teaching is that they need a way to, to address BMI. So um, in biology, it's a little different because you, we can just not deal with it, you know, ignore it. But that being said, I'm re reworking the, um, the biology lesson slides. I'm just updating everything and the BMI. I took out 
we only show it on one slide, which is the three time points that show diabetes growth and um, and growth of, growth of obesity over time. And I've decided to take out the BMI slide from that. So it will be gone. <laughs> um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, there are people on both sides of that conversation, but I've heard more often people saying that they, they don't want to, um, to focus on that or, or address it. So it, it feels kind of like, throwing it all in the, the laps of the health teachers. I don't know if that's the, the right way to do it either. Um, that's, I think, in what ends up happening. Yeah, we definitely talk about it in biology though. I We talk about it, a lot of health related things just because it's of high interest and it's all related and homeostasis and all that, so. Yeah. Well, and and I'm, I'm it's, it's too bad that, it, that talking about BMI becomes body shaming so quickly. So it would be a nice to be able to talk about BMI um, and maybe it, addressing it, you know, head on and just saying that talking about BMI is not body shaming, you know, that they're not the same thing, that, that we do need to educate around BMI um, in a very open and supportive environment. That I, it's, it's tricky. Um, it's we, an equity thing too for BMI because BMI was based on white bodies and you know so there's just I think I just don't like to use yeah. it I think because of a lot of that so well so so do you teach about obesity but not BMI or is no, or not I teach about obesity. Okay. Mm -mm. I'm all about love your body be happy you know enjoy yourself and try to give your body the nutrition that it needs to be as healthy as possible yeah. and take it out for walks and exercise and take care of yourself. But I don't talk about size. If anything, I tell them I'm for anti diet talk and, you know, anything to talk about why one body is more worthy than any other body or, you know, I just hate to associate. I, I know it's, it's a co-indicator, you know, way, not as a co-indicator, I know that, but I also feel like it shuts kids down so quickly that I just don't even want it to be, you know, part of it. So yeah. sounds like a very healthy way of, of dealing with that. And throughout the rest of the curriculum, we really um, try to pull apart the personal choices, you know, like it's just exercise more and eat better and then you'll be fine. Cause that's, that's not the lesson that we're trying to ultimately get across is that there are systemic um, situations that are contributing to this in ways that our environments have changed in ways that we are not even aware of that yeah. have nothing to do with um, pure personal choice. But yeah, it's anyway, that's disappearing. So um, I, I, I've heard yeah. you and I've heard other people do that. <laughs> One of my favorite things, I'm sure it's coming up, is where you talk about the videos and you have like the videos of all the kids of different cultures and races that are talking about their own experience. And that is always a like a, a great one. My students always really respond to that well. So I'm excited about, I'm starting this unit, I think next week. And so I'm excited to get into it all. Um, and that's a, that's a great lead into our, our next week's session, which is our place policy in type two diabetes, where we talk about in kind of the political environment and structure that kind of impacts uh, all these different factors. Um, and, you know, I think the medical field moves so fast sometimes we're moving past BMI or past all sorts of, you know, e even, you know, things happen so fast that Something that was used, you know, 10 years ago for kind of health checks, you know, we reassess it, we, we recognize that maybe that's not actually true because we're now kind of um, looking at the uh, various stigmatizations and inaccuracies within the kind of streamlined health system. And the one piece that I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm, I'm sad that we're missing kind of a lesson on is the new uh, diabetes drug, uh, Ozempic, mm. that um, is exorbitantly expensive, but you know, very wealthy people are able to afford it to use it for just weight loss rather than diabetes regulation. And 
it's it, because it's being purchased by people that are paying these really high, high, high prices for it, the drug's not available um, for people that could really benefit for it from, from a, a disease state. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's one of those that's just a, you know, how fast these things appear on the market, disrupt the ability for people to access kind of the healthcare they need. And, uh, you know, the medical industry goes on, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, are we still talk about Jimmy, that. Jimmy Kimmel's monologue in the Academy Awards, if any of you were, he, he mentioned that in the Academy Awards monologue last night, which I was like, oh, this is a so social thing. Oh, yeah. I'll have to like, find that and show it to students. Just an aside, looking at all yeah. the beautiful people in the audience was like an ad for um, this new drug. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, my challenge is I have a multilingual class this year with a lot of kids who don't speak English at all. And so my challenge is how do I, you know, how do I simplify this and make this something that's accessible to them? So that's what I'm looking at right now. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah. yeah. Very quick, I mean, um, is there any genetic basis to the higher prevalence of diabetes too in um, Hispanic culture? Or is it purely environmental? Do you know that? I never so, taught that, <laughs> I'm not quite, I don't know. The, this is one of those uh, um, uh, big questions of when we take um, genetic data, and we look at genetic risk factors for different disease states, but we pretend like there's not social factors at play or that there's nothing else that's okay. impacting that system. We can identify a ton of genes that are regular, you know, that correlate with certain oh, well, types of people. Week, 400? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and it's, and, and for me, it's, that's one of the limitations of medical genetics is that you can make these um, correlations that are not actually causations. And so you can link all these genes and look at family trees without ever thinking, oh, maybe these families are eating the same food and living similar lifestyles and, and or impacted by, um, you know, different oppressive factors yeah. built into the system. And um, we, so, we talked yeah. help, uh, all last, last, last week about well, it. Um, well, the next week <laughs> we really get into it. Yeah, will you be here next week? Because that yes. whole lesson addresses be, that specifically. I'm very interested, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So. All right. Yeah, take care, everyone. All right, bye.